Today's presentation is on early pest monitoring and prevention. Uh, we are you know, very quickly going to be hitting the spring and starting to see some of those uh, early pests. So the idea is to um, think about how we can establish a, a strong monitoring program for preventing some of these pests. Now, some of you might already have um, some, some scouts might have uh, some very good records. And so this might be, if anything, a bit of a refresher for you. Some of you uh, maybe do not have any, any process in play. Maybe you casually look at plants and when you see a problem, then you look for help. So you're really, um, you're, you're constantly trying to um, catch up with the problems that, that you're facing either in your landscape or in your greenhouse or nursery. So the whole purpose of this, and actually, sorry, just very quickly, I'm going to turn off. There's a, a little chime that plays when uh, people join in. So I'm just going to turn that off there. All right. So, um, uh, you know, when we're, when we're talking about monitoring and scouting, it's considered kind of the foundation of integrated pest management, right? So we're talking about a, a, a sound and economic strategy for uh, maintaining low pest populations. We need to know what's there and in what numbers uh, in order to determine what kind of action needs to be taken. Now, I'm going to take a, a, a slightly different uh, approach today that not only looks at, um, you know, kind of the, the dogma of IPM, but also looks at this new uh, strategy, which is referred to the systems approach to nursery management, which many of you may already be familiar with. A select few of you may be actually looking into becoming certified through this process. And this, the certification might not actually make sense for everyone, right? So it might it usually works well for uh, medium to maybe larger op sized operations. But the principles of SANC, I think, are, are ones that can be um, uh, widely applied and highly valuable. So some things to be uh, to consider about SANC is it is developed by the National Plant Board. So it is um, a national program that's kind of being rolled out on a state to state basis. And it's an audit-based system approach to plant production and certification to reduce pest risk and distribution. When we say audit-based, so instead of um, the alternate, which was inspection-based, let's say, uh, where you have TDA come and do regular inspections, in this case, the idea is that you have internal audits of a facility manual. So you develop uh, a, a, a very important protocol, a, a um, I should say heavily strategized protocol internally that then you audit on a regular basis. Uh, and then periodically that process is audited from an external agency such as TDA, but would be less frequent than say um, current, current practices. Uh, and it's, it's especially, um, you know, for any time you're doing interstate travel plant materials where you might need to get a final sanitary uh, certificate. The idea is that with this type of system, your internal audits would kind of replace that. And you just have periodic, again, external audits that would ensure that you are, you know, practicing what your own facility manual says you'll do in order to ensure that you're reducing uh, pest pressure. And uh, this, this uh, SANC process relies on identification of critical control points and implement, implementation of best management practices. And I think this is the part where uh, all of us can take something away from, from SANC, whether we're actually getting certified or not, is again, identifying critical control points. So that's uh, potential points of disease or insect entry or infestation and determining pest management practices for mitigating each of those. And it is ideal to have this thing actually formalized, to have it written down and, and about who is responsible and how it's actually checked. So that, that way you can uh, then revise it as needed. You can determine if it's effective or not. And you have personnel that are uh, responsible for ensuring that those uh, particular critical control points are essentially taken care of. Erica, so when he, yes. Erica, are you, uh, do you have a PowerPoint that you are sharing? Yeah, do you guys not see anything right now? <laughs> or... <laughs> yeah, let me share my screen here. That'll probably help. Yeah, yeah. Let me do that here. We'd love to see your face, by the way. You know, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're just seeing my face that whole time. Yeah, just I think I think the showing the PowerPoint may be helpful, you know, for yeah. the audience. I agree. <laughs> thank okay, you so thank much. You. Is it showing? Is it do you see my slide right now? Yes, yes. Now okay. I see the left panel and the slides. And okay, now do you see the full the, you see the full slide? Yes, full screen. Yes. Full All slides. right. Well, there's All there's right. not a whole lot. You didn't miss out on a whole lot except for a few beautiful visuals and colors. 
but this part is, I think, is kind of helpful to look at now. So when we're talking about, uh, <laughs> thanks, it would have been funny if I'd gotten halfway through the presentation and, until we had realized that. Um, and so one of the, uh, so when we're actually determining, say, our critical control points, it might help to draw out your, uh, your operation. So this is an example uh, that's given by the SANC um, resources. On, on basically drawing out, you know, you could draw this out in Excel or in PowerPoint, you know, it doesn't have to be a sophisticated drawing or perfectly to scale, but it gives you an idea of where are, let's say, your, your, your shipping docks, right, where your, um, your stuff that comes in, you want to ensure that is maybe left in a little bit of a quarantine or left in isolation, so like you would with anyone who's traveling right now with concerns of COVID, right? So anything that comes in, you want to keep in isolation for a while to ensure that it is clean plant material and make sure that it is inspected well before introducing to the rest of the nursery. We also want to ensure that if our shipping and receiving the same area, that they are not intermingling, right? So we don't want our things that we're about to ship to get infested with things that are just coming in that uh, we haven't had a chance yet to kind of clean up. That same way, there might be other critical control points, such as uh, certain forest barriers or uh, weed or, or, or natural habitats that might be a source of potential infestation into, into the nursery. Um, and there might be things like compost or, or um, waste areas that we want to ensure is not anywhere close to any of the growing media or anywhere close to any of the production areas. Because if you're, you know, removing highly infested or highly diseased materials, you don't want that to get right back onto your plants. So again, uh, you know, helping to formalize this will really help ensure that essentially you, you are creating a very good uh, defense against a lot of these diseases. Or as our own resident, Dr. Becky Bowling would maybe even say, whoops, or is that later on? Oops. Why is it not going? As our own uh, Dr. Becky Bowling would say, here we go. The best defense is a good offense. Dr. Becky Bowling, it just came to my uh, my my recent attention is um, is is quite skilled in martial arts, uh, and so unfortunately she's not here. I don't think yet, but we'll catch her later with that joke again. Uh, but when we're actually um, looking at that um, this the sank process again you know, in developing a good monitoring strategy, it may help to develop a risk assessment. So we do that first by identifying potential pest pathways in your nursery and strategies to address them. And then actually formalizing that in a type of facility, facility manual. Now, in this case, if you're not actually looking to get certified with SANC, it doesn't have to be uh, a particular or specific format to fit SANC's uh, kind of um, template. But instead, it would really, again, still help to formalize uh, what are some of these critical control points and then what are some, uh, some, some strategies to, to mitigate those or to monitor for those pests and ensure that you are uh, managing them before they become a problem. And so there's actually a video uh, posted on YouTube by Dr. Wayne Dixon, who is with the National Plant Board on, you know, if you look up on YouTube, Systems Approach to Nursery Certification, Wayne Dixon, and you'll find a full uh, one hour presentation specifically on SANC, if that is something of interest. So before we kind of go on, so um, y'all didn't realize that you would have some involvement here. And actually, I am seeing that the instructions are not showing up. Um, let's see here if I can make it show up real quick. <laughs> doop, 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 doop. Is it just uh, loading? Um, no, no, it, um, well, it, it is here. So uh, people would need to basically um, send in responses, but there should be a set of instructions on how to actually submit responses and it's not popping up. So uh, just give me one brief moment here. And let me see if I can find those instructions. Yeah, here it is. And basically, you're going to have several options, and they could send in using uh, texting. Exactly. Well, so you're going to use your uh, your smartphone uh, to go to. Here we go. So the link that I just put in the chat. You know what? Actually, let me um, make it an actual uh, URL. I'll make it a little bit easier. Uh, there we go. If you click on that link, and actually, let me just double check here real quick. 
Yeah, that should bring you to uh, the presentation uh, kind of questions. And there'll be a few questions to this presentation that I'll ask for your input. Uh, I mean, not only will it kind of help inform kind of future presentations, but I think it'll kind of help inform a little bit of what uh, I'll talk about here. So if you go to that link, you can use your smartphone to go to it, or you can use your computer right now to click on it. It'll ask you for like a name, and then uh, it'll ask you questions as they come up in the presentation. And you could start to uh, submit some responses. So I guess the first one I want to ask is, what are some advantages to monitoring? I mean, why do we actually even bother uh, to monitor or scout. So I'll give y'all a, this is like kind of a more open-ended question. So I'll give y'all a quick moment to uh, respond to that one there. And I'm gonna quickly check to make sure that it's working say on my phone here. All right, look at that. It's incredible fun. Yeah, nip problems in the bud and save money and labor and resources later. To see what's in the garden and how bad it might be. Yeah, so we are uh, not only seeing what's there, but also uh, how, how abundant is that population to determine if a treatment is necessary, right? So insecticides are getting progressively more and more expensive. So uh, you, you only want to use it when you really need to. Additionally, there's obviously things like uh, non-target impacts or unintended consequences that uh, we want to avoid. So we want to only spray it when you really need to. Next, understand baseline populations, uh, early identification of problems and infestations. Yeah, I think those are all uh, things that I would consider good advantages as, as well. Um, isn't it important to look at your crops frequently just to know them better? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it helps put a, a pulse, uh, you know, so your finger on the pulse of your plants to just know how they're how well they're doing. Um, and and so in the same during that same time in which you're just looking at how how your plants are doing, you can get an idea of what uh, those pest infestations are, are looking like. So uh, yeah, so I think we hit on a lot of those. Some that I listed. You know, best timing for effective and economic pest control, right? So some mentioned like only spray when you need to. Um, additionally, I mean, if, if there is a particular pest population in there, you want to make sure you're spraying them when they're actually most vulnerable. So there are some insect stages. I mean, if they're mostly pupae or if they're mostly in the egg stage and you're using some kind of a insecticide that needs to be consumed, um, then you are poorly timing that insecticide application. You are using, uh, you know, not, not the best timing for your um, for, for suppression. I uh, want to determine effectiveness of application. I also have that in there too. So even if you, um, you know, you, you monitor, you know, you have a high insect population and you decide to go in and, and, and control them, it's important to know whether your insecticide actually worked. Um, and so by doing some good monitoring and get an idea of, of what's happening with those uh, pest populations. Uh, reduce unnecessary applications and unintended pesticide effects, which we already spoke about, and learn about pest complex affecting different crops. And I think that was something someone mentioned about knowing what's there and, and in what numbers. So next thing, so this one might be a little unconventional, but what are some disadvantages to monitoring? So again, using that same link, uh, you should be able to contribute uh, to this particular question now. Time, time, time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so monitoring the scouting is labor uh, and labor is time and time is money. And so at some point you have to decide uh, if there's a trade-off between, um, you know, all the time you're spending scouting or just spray. Um, spray preventatively, right? Uh, and so there, there is a, a, a time at which, you know, you have to decide. So you have to, you have to decide how you're going to monitor a scout in order to really reduce the amount of time it takes. Knowledge of what to look for. Yeah. So this is, um, you know, it's not super easy to know what to look for, right? And, um, you know, even if you find something there, it's, it's sometimes hard to know, is that actually a pest? Is that something of concern? Is that population a high population? <laughs> is there a disadvantage? Really? Yeah, I think we just uh, we mentioned a couple. I think there certainly are some disadvantages uh, if, if you're not cautious. Yeah, labor intensive, uh, monotonous work. Yeah, it's um, probably some of the least fun work uh, that I had to do in my PhD was just counting white flies in cages and greenhouses for hours and hours on end. 
um, and it's, you know, hot <laughs> and, and unpleasant. And it's, yeah, once, once you know, you know, specific things you're looking for, it's relatively monotonous. Yeah, requires time and consistency. Yeah, so even when you're uh, super busy, you need to make sure you're still doing that monitoring and scouting, say, on a weekly basis. Uh, because if you miss a few weeks, you really don't know what those populations are doing. So it does require that. Absolutely. I think those are some excellent uh, disadvantages. Uh, we've, we've recognized that, right? I think it's very important to recognize that uh, monitoring isn't all um, isn't all just positive, right? It's not like you have nothing to lose by monitoring and scouting. And so we have to also be uh, very um, uh, cautious about the strategy that we're using. Uh, cognizant of the strategy we're using in order to optimize the benefits uh, or the advantages of monitoring. So it can be labor intensive. Uh, summarizing the data or actually understanding your monitoring data can be technically intensive. So we'll get into in a moment here about uh, different types of data that, that you could record and then how to kind of summarize it. But that can take a little bit of time to find the, the right way of summarizing the data that works best for your operation. Uh, it is considered maybe less practical and efficient in highly diverse crops, which is usually what we're dealing with. If you look at cotton guides or corn guides or wheat guides, I mean, they're relatively straightforward. They have uh, very specific pest complexes, very specific action thresholds. You know, if you reach more than this many per leaf and this percentage of, uh, of stocks have whatever, then you spray. Um, whereas when it's a highly diverse crop that uh, the, the price also varies greatly, right? And, you know, a lot of those action thresholds develop greatly on how much you're actually selling that plant for. Uh, so it gets, it gets a lot less practical or, or a lot less um, simpler when we're looking at highly complex systems. And regular monitoring can be considered superfluous when dealing with zero tolerance for a pest. You know, so if, in other words, if you have a zero tolerance for the pest, like why even uh, bother monitoring, you're likely to have something you might as well spray on a regular basis. Now, before we uh, make the argument that we all have a zero uh, pest tolerance, you know, I'd say that there are only very specific situations where this may apply. For example, if you have a large monocrop and the pest you're dealing with can vector a virus that might, you know, destroy your entire crop very quickly. Um, when we're talking ornamentals, I'd argue that we do not have a zero pest tolerance. It's, it's higher than zero. And just looking at poinsettias alone, any of you familiar with, with that work that I did where I scouted uh, retailers across East Texas and, uh, and, and I categorized them either as big box stores, grocery stores, garden stores, or florists. I did this over two years, over 2016 and 2018, so two years later, and counted the number of white flies, uh, specifically white fly nymphs in this case that we saw on those poinsettias. Uh, in 2016, on average, in the big box stores, I found about you know five to ten uh, in grocery stores. Uh, so we're talking like Brookshire's or Fresh and things like that. Well over 30 on average uh, nymphs, um, and this is all within a one minute count. So we limited ourselves to 60 seconds per poinsettia. When we look at 2018, we had the situation where it was all quite a bit higher. Nymphs varied from about 25 per plant on average, all the way up to about 75. And this is at a florist. This is, like I said, a florist that's selling poinsettias in pristine looking condition for about $50 a pot. And this florist is actually going out to the nursery and handpicking the poinsettias herself. So she is actually not seeing uh, these, these, these nymphs on there. And we found some that had, you know, again, this is an average. We found some with over 200 nymphs on them. Again, that's what we could, what we could count within 60 seconds. I'm not making the argument for uh, being completely laxed on, on uh, pest management or that we should tolerate um, you know, all, all the pests we want on these, on these plants, but rather I think saying that we have a zero pest tolerance is unrealistic. And instead, I think over time, we should try to develop uh, for, for each type of plant, what is considered undetectable by uh, the general market when, when you're actually going to sell what is considered undetectable. And that is kind of our, our threshold. And so uh, you know, when you go back to the monitoring advantages and choosing when to spray, right? So kind of tr a traditional approach uh, to spraying or a conventional in conventional agriculture. So in this case is, let's say we've got apple trees. You can see there's a specific uh, date range, all right? And for each of those date ranges, there is a specific 
spray schedule, specific uh, thing to spray for. And uh, this, this does not work for, for greenhouse ornamental nursery, because again, we're, we're just too diverse. Um, and and uh, pest complexes are just uh, very different depending on, on what we're dealing with. Um, oops, sorry, let me just, I think we got someone um, talking here. Here we go. Um, so the next approach is uh, using plant phenology. All right. So you can see here at the top, kind of the developmental stage of the plant and using that to inform what we should look for. So the pests are here and you can see that it says basically to monitor for these particular pests based on that plant phenology. And this would be great if we had this for every single ornamental or every single tree and shrub that we grew, that'd be pretty remarkable. Um, but unfortunately things just change so much and again are so variable uh, when we're talking about our industry that developing something like this uh, would be unfeasible and, and not only unfeasible, but probably in, impractical because uh, just trying to then update all of those on a regular basis would be, uh, require a, a very large amount of resources. So this, this can work for monocrops. Again, this can work for situations where you have a, uh, one type of uh, plant that's, that's grown in large abundance. But again, it falls apart in diverse and ephemeral systems, right? So we have things that, that we just keep for uh, you know, uh, a few weeks, maybe a few months, um, and then a completely new crop is in there. So things are shifting and changing far too rapidly uh, for this to be a long-term strategy. So instead, uh, we, we rely on these monitoring tools to get an idea of our change in populations, insect populations over time. And so we're going to go over some of these different tools and then talk about how to record that data or some, some examples, I should say, of how to record the data and how to tabulate it to give us an idea in that change in population. So you all are probably already very familiar with a lot of these tools, right? We have hand lenses, we have sticky cards, such as yellow sticky cards. Um, we have aspirators are excellent for sucking up small little insects um, and, and capturing them in a vial for later identification. Uh, and then vials, containers, and baggies. If you have scouts, um, it's not a bad idea to make sure that they have a healthy supply of these in their pockets so that they can uh, collect things as needed uh, in, in order to get a better identification. When we're talking yellow sticky cards, I think, you know, uh, there's identification of insects on the plant, and then there's in, uh, identification of insects on a yellow sticky card. And those are almost very different because um, on the yellow sticky card, they are flat and squished, um, you know, not in their natural pose. So it can be a lot more difficult uh, to identify. And here we could, you know, by, by the fact that these are kind of whitish and look like white flies, we might incorrectly assume that those are some kind of white flies. But actually these, again, it takes a little bit of a time and, and practice are actually a woolly aphids. So they're types of aphids that grow a white wax on them. And in this case, this is in a poinsettia greenhouse. Despite the fact that we're getting a lot of these woolly aphids in the poinsettia greenhouse, it is not something to be concerned of. It is not, uh, does not mean you need to start spraying for white flies, especially because this, I mean, these woolly aphids will not uh, establish on the poinsettias. So, so you're catching a lot of things that might look like white flies, uh, but, but actually not. So here's what white flies look like uh, on, on yellow sticky cards and their uh, white um, wings are usually pretty mangled by the time that they are dead on there. And so, you know, you, you really don't see the white, you see more of their beige kind of body uh, with a little of, a, of their, their white wings. Uh, so it really does help. So even when I'm looking at LEC cards, I usually need the help of a hand lens or a head lens in order to correctly determine what, what I'm dealing with on those sticky cards. We also have different types of white flies that again, doesn't necessarily mean you need to be concerned. There's the banded wing white fly that is not a major pest of, of a lot of our ornamentals. So even though you see it on your yellow sticky card does not mean it is of major concern. Another thing to note with yellow sticky cards is that they um, do not do a great job of telling us how many insects we have on our plants. They do a good job of telling us if those insects are around. So they're a very good early detection of certain insect pests and should help inform our monitoring of the actual plants themselves rather than give us an idea of the actual abundance in the, in the plants. 
Uh, I do suggest, you know, I'd mentioned uh, either hand lenses or head lenses. I rarely use a hand lens anymore. I've replaced it with a lens for my phone, but when I'm doing a lot of dedicated scouting, I usually use a head lens and they're not expensive, 17, 18 bucks on Amazon. You look up headband magnifier and uh, they're very useful tools uh, because then both of your hands are free. And a lot of these insect pests we'll talk about here a little bit later on, are usually under undersides of leaves. So in order to find them, we, we need to have both of our hands free in order to move those, flip those leaves over and, and get it within our uh, field of focus. But Dr. Uh, Vafai, doesn't it, that you, one give you the buckeye symptom? What is the buckeye symptom? Like it makes you cross-eyed a little bit or what? No, don't you have a picture of yourself? Oh, you know, your bug eye. <laughs> My bug eye. Yes, yeah. your bug I th- eye. I thought you said buck eye. No, bug <laughs> eye. Oh, certainly. They won't make you look very attractive. So if your uh, nursery is also doubling as a uh, modeling photo shoot, then um, that, that might not, <laughs> this might not be optimal. But if you don't mind, uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Some of us look great in those, says Dr. Bowling. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I look great in that as well. I think it's a matter of perspective. Um, but yeah, they are, uh, they are certainly, um, kind of fun, kind of fun to look at, um, people wearing them for sure. Um, uh, and I know, you know, whenever I walk around the office wearing one of these, I usually get some looks from, from all the other staff, but you know, haters are going to hate, you know, you just got to keep moving along. Um, we also have these lenses that go on phones. Now, um, I have tried just a few of them, um, some of which did not work well. And I returned because they cause a lot of, um, kind of aberrations, chromatic aberrations or, or distortion of the image. So you need to make sure you get a decent lens, one that has a decent lens. And I can't tell you all the ones that I know have decent lenses. I just know the ones that I've tried. This is one of them, which is the Zenvo. It's about $40 on Amazon and it has a macro lens, which is this 15 X lens and a wide angle lens that actually uh, twists on there. And you just clip this on your phone. So it's kind of convenient for clipping on and off very easily. And uh, you get quite a bit of uh, magnification. So it's uh, kind of a nice one. The other one, uh, the one I actually use a little bit more, uh, but it's a little bit more of an investment. And, but this is what I use instead of a hand lens because it allows me not only to get that magnification, but also to take a photo and or video, uh, which is, you know, even more useful than just a hand lens. Uh, but it gives me 10X magnification and you have to buy a special case for your phone. So like here, uh, I don't know if you can see in my um, my camera right now, that's the case that I'm using on my phone. And it has a very specific slot for that lens to actually clip in. So that means the lens is actually very small and compact. You can easily throw it in your pocket. Uh, again, if you're scouting on a daily basis, this might be considered, uh, again, a, a bigger investment, but also a, a more convenient uh, way of, of magnifying and taking images out in the field. There are also USB uh, microscopes, and I actually f- forgot to mention those that are uh, field microscopes, right? Little hand microscopes you can get anywhere from 100 to over $1,000. And those can also be very handy as well in the field for getting uh, up to and or more than 200 times magnification. So you can get very close in your specimens uh, to take some good photos in the field as well. And then lastly, some microscopes. This is my, my son back when he was a little Michelin boy. And uh, that are these are also very handy for in the lab, right? So you're collecting your samples and bringing them into an office, I should say. It's not a huge investment, okay? And again, if you're a larger operation that that regularly needs to look at things a little bit closer, it doesn't hurt to have one of these on hand. A lot of photos that I take that are very close up of specimens are usually of my phone held up to the eyepiece of one of these things and surprisingly works much better than a lot of the hundreds and or thousands of dollar microscope cameras that I have seen on the market. So it works uh, surprisingly well for getting very close. You can see down here an example of one of those USB uh, microscopes that you can actually detach from there as well and, and take out in the field. We also have a piece of, uh, I do recommend having a piece of white foam board or, or some type of white sheet that's inside a plastic sleeve for this beading technique. This is excellent for, especially for thrips. 
uh, where, you know, you put this piece of white foam board under that flower and you'll, you'll slap that flower above that white foam board and those strips will fall on it. They're a lot easier to see on there than inside the flower. So a lot of these insects will lodge themselves within plant material, especially Western flower thrips. And so it's very hard to see them. In this case, we have a very high infestation. So you can see them on the outside, these actual uh, flower petals as well. But um, in many cases, if you wanna catch them early, uh, it really helps to have uh, some kind of simple uh, board for, for this beading technique. We also have things like double-sided sticky tape. So this is going to be more useful for things like uh, either mealybug crawlers or scale crawlers. And this is actually what, this is our um, standardized sanctioned method for monitoring crepe myrtle bark scale across the country, uh, where we'll actually wrap crepe myrtle branches with this double-sided sticky tape and replace it on a weekly basis or move that one, put it on a piece of grid paper and inspect it under a microscope. And you can see these crawlers, these crepe myrtle bark scale crawlers. And why that's important is you'll know a lot of our recommendations when it comes to crepe myrtle bark scale control is to apply when crawler activity starts to increase towards a peak. Now, across three years and across several locations, you know, we've seen that peak is usually between mid-April to end of April. But if you use this monitoring technique, you'll know what, when that is specifically for your area. And so you can target your insecticide applications to get them uh, really well. Uh, next uh, is this uh, burlap band. And this can be used for a number of uh, typically uh, crawling caterpillars um, that you basically have a burlap sack uh, that you put around the branch of the tree. You tie a rope around halfway and you fold down the rest of that burlap. And what that does is these, these caterpillars will usually go in there uh, to kind of hide or some type of habitat, or as they go up, they kind of get stuck. They'll kind of get lodged up in this burlap. And uh, at that point, you can you can crush them, right? You, you could eliminate them, but it can also be a technique of actually monitoring their populations uh, over time as well. Uh, and then we got a sticker, sticky uh, barrier band, uh, which is very similar to that, that uh, one that we just saw for caterpillars. But in this case, it's actually going to be sticky. And what you're doing is you're uh, using this, this gray tape around uh, the, the trunk of the tree. Uh, and then you're basically uh, using a brush, let's say, to put some uh, bug gum, uh, roxo bug glue, or tanglefoot. So it's a very sticky solution. And the reason why it's important to do it over this tape rather than just on the tree is that it could potentially damage the tree, right? So by doing it over this tape, you can remove the tape later uh, as needed. But again, anything crawling up or down that tree will get uh, stuck. I see Carlos has posted something. Let's see, the above link is a free article on American entomologist describing the use of sanitizing gel to preserve insect samples for identification. Thank you so much, Carlos. So in that chat is an excellent link for preserving samples in, um, let's see, is that, yeah, sanitizing gel. So like, and, and I know it's kind of funny for a while, um, I had that in my presentation and I took it out during the beginning of COVID because it was so hard to find. Uh, but now that it's easier to find uh, hand, hand sanitizer again, um, that is certainly uh, one way of preserving your specimens uh, over time. Uh, another uh, example of a type of trap is, are these pitfall traps. Uh, and, and usually they're put uh, in the ground and some kind of you know, antifreeze or water with soap. And you usually want some kind of a roof over that little pitfall trap uh, to prevent any water uh, or, or other debris from pulling in that cup. And the idea is that these insects crawling on the ground are going to fall in there and drown. And you can collect that say on a weekly basis and get an idea of what those insect populations are. We also have pheromone traps, right? So this is an example of a very specific chemical cue being emitted from this tube that is attracted to the antennae of this specific species of moth. And you can see it's getting very excited as soon as the air starts to flow. And that's because, so a lot of these different uh, insect species, they need to find mates in this like vast environment. And how they do that is by releasing sex pheromone. They release a chemical cue often by the females to attract males. And it has to be very specific to their own species. Otherwise they'll be attracting insects of all kinds of species to them, right? They don't want that. So uh, what chemical uh, ecologists or chemical entomologists have done is isolate those chemical signatures, chemical cues, and formulated them uh, into traps. 
so that now you can basically buy these pheromone traps and uh, attract that specific um, type of insect that you're looking for. So one that is kind of important, uh, especially for our industry that you may look into is one for the Duponcellia moth or European pepper moth that we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, which is a, a very problematic invasive. We also have the sweet potato weevil is another one that is, you know, also a lot of uh, counties under quarantine that uh, you can use this pheromone trap to, uh, to, to determine if they're in your area as well. So there are actually many pheromone traps, some of which are just listed here. So you can see the sweet potato weevil and European pepper moth uh, listed here. There's uh, several. So, um, there, you know, some of the main uh, common pests we encounter don't have pheromone traps. So like you can't find them for thrips or aphids or white flies. Uh, but some of these other, especially a lot of different moth species, um, there are a lot of pheromone traps for them. And then we have some just uh, general traps. So uh, especially for, for a lot of beetle borers, we don't have a lot of pheromone traps. We usually use some of these generalist traps. And these can be homemade uh, just using a bottle uh, that you're, you're inverting, in this case, fill with ethanol or soapy water. Uh, but the ethanol is considered attractive in this case. So, so you'd actually use ethanol to kind of attract, especially things like uh, these borer beetles. And you cut a hole so that they kind of come in, go in the ethanol and they drown. And you can, you know, take off that cap to drain it into another container, uh, you know, uh, so that you can collect it, say, on a, on a weekly basis. And here's one that's a slightly different design that's in, in some cases considered maybe a little superior uh, that you can put um, an actual bait inside there. So your ethanol will be there and this would be soapy water. So in that case, um, you can keep your ethanol in there over, over time and just replenish the ethanol as needed and flush out that soapy water um, to, to collect your beetles on a regular basis as well. Uh, thank you guests for annotating my presentation there. I should probably turn that off in the future. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I can uh, clear. There we go. Um, oops, sorry. Let me just get rid of some of this stuff here. All right. So when we're actually sampling, uh, we want to look at, um, we want to break down our system into pest management units, which we already kind of uh, spoke about when we were talking about this, the SANC facility manual, looking at your location and identifying critical control points. Um, and y'all already your greenhouses are usually going to have a specific designation. You might have, um, you know, different uh, names for different nursery pads. And so all of those are, can be considered separate pest management units that when we're monitoring or scouting, we want to ensure that we are recognizing, recognizing them as separate because we might have different pest pressures, different disease pressure and so on and so forth in those different areas. And when, when we're inside that particular area, we want to do what's called a representative sample when we're monitoring. So in this case, let's just say we only have four benches within a greenhouse. Uh, it can be kind of uh, easy or, or convenient, let's say, to only look at uh, the plants that are, let's say, uh, along the walkway or, or most convenient to look at as we kind of walk through. And this unfortunately we considered a poor sample because it's possible that uh, we have a higher pest pressure near the back where the wet wall is, or maybe we have more pest pressure um, on one of the benches where we have a certain cultivar that's a little more susceptible. So we wanna ensure that we are uh, doing a, a, a better sample. We can do what's called a transect, okay? So in this case, we're making sure we kind of walk along a line. And this is just a way of trying to make sure that we're covering a good uh, part of that particular um, greenhouse when we're actually scouting. Another example is quadrants. So we might actually break it down in this case into four or by each bench. And then within each of those quadrants, we randomly look at a particular plant. Now, my, my favorite go-to and or the one that I'd perhaps suggest is a targeted pseudo-random. And that's essentially um, you are walking up and down these benches and um, you're somewhat randomly selecting plants to look at, but also you're trying to get in the eyes of, you know, the insect pest and trying to think which one looks the most delicious or which one looks like it has damage and inspect those ones. You're, you're doing some visual inspection and selecting a plant based on that as you move along. And uh, by doing that, again, you're still getting hopefully a representative sample. You want to make sure you're not looking only along one area um, and, and getting, but, but also kind of targeting a little bit towards where, you know, your intuition tells you those, those pests might be. Uh, we also want to ideally do standardized sampling, right? So uh, for example, if we see on this first bench, 
uh, that plant is clean. All right, second bench, plant is clean. Third bench, plant is clean. Fourth bench, we see it's not clean. There's a, a caution or danger in just saying, you know what, I'm just going to intensify my sampling on this particular bench over time. Uh, because it might be the case that you actually had uh, pests on those other uh, benches as well, but because you increased your sampling on that particular bench, you may have caught all of a sudden more infested plant materials. So you want to try and keep it relatively representative, especially if we're trying to make conclusions about specific areas. So we, you know, if we had only looked, uh, increased our sampling here, we might have concluded falsely that only this bench is infested and the others are not. So when it comes to the type of data we want to collect, um, I think oftentimes what we do is, is uh, ratings, right? So we're, we go to a plant and you might look at a bunch of leaves and look for, uh, let's say aphids, and we'll rate our inf aphid infestation from zero, like there's nothing to four, like that population is way too high. But what I encourage you to consider doing is some kind of a count. Um, and so that's numerical data. And the reason for that is it's much easier to summarize and tabulate and is usually a lot more objective than a rating, right? So my rating of one or two might be a lot different than your rating of one or two. Uh, whereas numerical account, uh, in this case, uh, we might not need to actually count every single aphid on a plant. And what I'd almost suggest and, and what we often do is a timed count. So it might be 30 seconds per plant count as many aphids as you can, right? Uh, and with that numerical data it allows you to actually tabulate this data over time. So you can actually see trends in those populations. That's going to be a little bit more meaningful than, than a rating. So you want to summarize that data as a mean or perhaps as a median for each uh, pest management unit. So uh, again, either consider time limited counts or estimating uh, for high populations is another possibility. So you might count how many aphids are on one leaf and multiply that by however many leaves are on that on that plant, as long as you know the number of aphids on all those leaves is, is relatively even. We can also do binaries. So that's presence absence, and this this could be a promising strategy. Uh, and the reason is because some of our work showed that uh, in this case on the y-axis have the, the uh, log transformed. So it's just a, um, uh, just a slightly transformed version of the actual counts of white flies. And on the x-axis, I have proportion of plants infested. So if I looked at 50 plants and 25 are infested, that's a 50% uh, infestation. I call that binary because each plant you're looking at is either infested or not infested. So it's a one or a zero. And then from there, you get a proportion infestation. And our data showed so far that it seems like um, that proportion of plants infested could be a pretty reasonable indicator of your density of that particular pest. So in this case, the higher the proportion of plants infested, so by the time you get to about 50%, uh, you have quite a bit of uh, white flies starting to get on there. And from there, you can start to create some thresholds based on proportion data. So you can say, all right, if 25% of our plants have infestation, that usually means you've had enough pockets of, of large white fly populations that they've infested 25% of your plant material that it's really time to take action. Now rating, this is probably my, my least recommended. And again, just because it's quite subjective, but even if you're gonna do this, you can still get some good trends and data. So in this case, we have to do like a plant rating for white flies. And this might be the number of plants that are either a rating one, two, three, or four. So within a pest management unit, you look at 50 plants uh, of those, well, in this case, let's say 120 plants, right? So most of them, let's say at week 28, are uh, a rating of one. So very few white flies. You have some that are a rating of two, three, and very few that are a rating of four. Now you might see, whoops, you might see over time, those numbers starting to shift. So by week 49, if you do nothing, those populations start to move from that rating of one and two over to three and four. And this is when you know that that population is essentially growing out of control and it's time to do something. So 
going back to, uh, so now she's going to documenting some of this data, right? You know, I would suggest if it's possible, you know, you might hand record it, uh, but then by putting it into a computer, you can very quickly tabulate and or summarize that data. And here's just an example, all right, of uh, one of the data sheets that we had going here, where it's, you know, we have the, the transplant date of this plant, the cultivar, the actual plant itself, the greenhouse number, which can be our pest management unit, uh, the week number in this case was uh, specific to a research trial, but it might be the grower week number and date. And here we've counted a number of whitefly nymphs and whitefly adults. Now for you, it might not be relevant to know each life stage. So you might just be counting whiteflies, counting mealybugs and thrips and fungus gnats. And by doing that again now over time, and you might again try and pick a representative sample. So um, trying to pick a sufficient number of plants within a given area that is hopefully going to be representative of what's actually in there. And over time, you'll have this good data set to actually uh, look at trends in populations. And that's really important because the question here is, you know, how many white flies, as an example, is too many, or how many aphids is too many? And it's hard to really know unless we actually track this data and look at trends over time. So as an example, uh, here's a particular uh, greenhouse uh, situation. We have two different pest management units or two different greenhouses. We have this uh, cyan or, or teal colored one and this orange one. You can see a weak number on the x-axis, an average number of immatures per plant uh, during each of those uh, sampling periods. And you can see here that, you know, once we first started monitoring, we started seeing some, on average, some immatures, right? And the question is, is this already too many to spray? Well, you can see already that there's an uptrend, but then a downtrend, and then an uptrend and a downtrend. So it kind of suggests at that point, it's not really important yet to do anything. Now, by week 10, we can see a sharp increase that then also increases after that. This gives us an idea. Now, you'll notice here, this in this pest management unit, it went up and went right back down with no intervention. So this should give you an idea that, you know what, in this situation, we're okay. There's maybe some natural enemies or the white flies just couldn't take hold. Maybe there's some natural fungi, entomopathogenic fungi that are killing them that we don't need to worry about. Uh, but in this case here, it's time to intervene, right? This, this population is starting to increase uh, in an uncontrolled manner. So that's when we might want to come in with our intervention. And you can see those populations starting to go back down. And by the time you go to market, you can see those populations are back down near our other uh, pest management unit. So this is where the insecticide applications are made. And you can see here that these two, despite this one looking much lower than this one, you can see this, this, this is what we call a standard error or standard deviation. It's some kind of um, variance around the mean. That's also important to capture because that tells us how far numbers from that average, right? If, uh, if we have like, you know, a uh, hundred plants that are, are, are zero and one that has all of a sudden 500 uh, white flies, our average uh, is going to be uh, not zero. And we're going to have a lot of variation, right? Because like all of a sudden it's seeing that there's, there's a lot of differences between these, uh, the numbers around that very, that, that mean. And so it's very important to capture that because uh, here, even though these look, these three numbers look very different, they're actually quite similar because they have a lot of numbers actually overlapping. And once we do our insecticide applications, you can see it gets knocked down, right? There's still a lot of overlap in this variance, but then that variance is drastically reduced as our populations are reduced. All right. So now the last thing we're going to go into is talking about some of our main early season pests. It is not possible uh, to try and capture them all, but this is actually, I use this uh, presentation to help start formulating a, a new field guide. So we did uh, have one back in 2002 for the uh, nursery and floral industry, this one right here, that is uh, a little bit outdated. A lot of the information is still super relevant. As you can imagine, the life cycle of aphids has not changed in the last 20 years, but there are some new pests to be included and in, in, in updated photos and information. Um, and so um, we're, we're going to talk about just some of those. And before we do, however, I'd like to hear um, about what were some of your most problematic pests this year. So again, you're going to use that poll everywhere link. I'm going to uh, paste that again in the chat. Or am I? Pollev.com. All right. So you're going to... Uh, click on that link and you can, you can add a bunch, right? So what were some of your most problematic pests this last year? So we got aphids, 
mealybugs, thrips. Got weevil, spider mites, <laughs> spider mites, yeah. Thomas put in chat a uh, flea beetle. Flea beetle, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, flea beetle came to my attention a few times this last year, surprisingly. Um, not usually something that does come to my attention, but yeah, so that's that's kind of a surprising one. All right, so I think we got so uh, fortunately, basically all of these are <laughs> in in the uh, sub selection of of insects that I chose to kind of put in this presentation here. But all we're going to talk about is basically this is almost like a a field guide. It's going to be a picture, general description, and damage of of a few of these different common insects. Uh, that you're going to see, especially early in the season. So aphids, right, are, uh, you know, one sixteenth, one eighth, eighth of an inch long. They're soft bodied. They uh, have this distinct feature known as cornicles here. They're like little chimneys coming off of their rear. Um, not all adults are winged. So it's only when they really have high density populations, they start to form some winged adults. So, uh, so, so that's, that's an important note to make. All adults have this, what's referred to as a kaja. So that's this, um, this feature right here. So they have these two cornicles and then this kaja right here. Uh, and they produce live young. Some species in cooler climates can produce eggs in the fall. I, I don't suspect that's the case here in Texas, although it's possible. Uh, and they produce honeydew and sooty mold as a result of their feeding. We have azalea lace bugs and other lace bugs that can be quite similar as well. Uh, so you can see here that they have this lace pattern on their wings and some dark banding as well. They're about one eighth of an inch long, soft bodied. They overwinter as eggs. So if you have some uh, materials you're keeping uh, over winter and, um, and, and they had an, a previous infestation of azalea lace bugs, there's a good chance that that population is overwintering there is going to come right back again early season. So you got to be ready uh, to, to take some action. And they cause a stippling damage. And they're, most of these insects actually are usually on the undersides of the leaves. So again, you usually need to look on the underside. And you're going to see these, um, these oil slicks, I like to think of them. Uh, they're basically like these little black spots. So it's actually their frass uh, as a result of their feeding. And this is actually the nymph. This is the immature uh, azalea lace bug. We got box elder bugs that are half inch long, uh, dark brown or black with conspicuous red markings on their wings. Uh, they generally cause low damage to trees and shrubs. So generally not considered a, a major, con major concern when it comes to uh, management strategies. And here are their immatures and their eggs right there. The citrus flatted plant hoppers. So we have a number of insects that are kind of waxy, right? And we'll talk about crate myrtle bark scale, I think is maybe next. Uh, we have mealy bugs. We already saw the woolly aphid uh, that all have this waxy appearance. And it's not uncommon that people will assume when they see something like this, that it's mealy bugs. Um, but this is actually the immature form of the citrus flatted plant hopper. One way of knowing is when you approach it, when you approach it, especially with like your finger, they will, uh, these, these plant hoppers will move to the opposite side of the stem. They'll move in a lateral movement left and right to kind of hide behind the stem. They are very uh, shy, essentially. And they overwinter as eggs and emerge around March. So again, if this is a particular pest, and this is the adult right here that is winged, this is a pest that you um, face on a regular basis, it'll be important to start monitoring very early, especially for those immatures. They feed on a large variety of plants, such as camellias, azaleas, viburnum, and magnolias, and they uh, produce honeydew and sooty mold as well. We got crepe myrtle bark scale. All right, that's also relatively early season. Like I mentioned, 
from what we have seen across a few locations and across a few years is that uh, those immatures are starting to emerge uh, between mid to late April is when we start to get uh, at least the peak activity in, in their emergence. And um, if you've had infestation with criminal bark scale in the past, it's likely they are there again, unless uh, you've taken any intervention. Their population uh, naturally waxes and wanes year after year. Uh, one possibility is due to natural predators that might be feeding on them. They feed on crepe myrtle. We've also seen them on beauty berry in the landscape. We've also seen them uh, on loose strife and pomegranate and some other uh, plant species in, um, in contained settings as well. So those are potential hosts of crepe myrtle bark scale too. Um, and these large uh, round ones are the female egg sacs. And these smaller, longer oblong uh, kind of waxy ones are the, uh, the, the male pupae. So they metamorphose from a, um, uh, an immature male. You can see uh, these immature uh, nymphs here over to these uh, winged adult. And so the immatures you can see are very hard to see with the naked eye. And like I mentioned earlier, helps to use double-sided sticky tape or at least using a hand lens to detect that population really early. Flea hoppers, all right. So someone had mentioned flea hoppers um, or, or flea beetle, actually, sorry. Flea beetle is uh, quite different from a flea hopper, all right? So a flea hopper is a sucking insect pest. So in this case, you can see also causes these types of oil slicks uh, and they're less than 1 16th of an inch long. So they're quite small, similar to flea beetles. When disturbed, they will quickly hop off and, and um, kind of disappear. So they can be hard to actually see uh, if you're disturbing the plant material. So that's where it's really important to look at the plants as you approach it, as you're flipping the leaves to ensure that uh, you see anything that, that jumps off as you go. And they overwinter as eggs. So again, if you have a history of infestation in that particular area uh, and you have not changed up the plant material, there's a good chance you're gonna get them right back again. Now, flea beetles, on the other hand, they cause chewing damage, right? And they cause uh, kind of a, what looks like a, um, a buckshot, right? So you get a bunch of holes uh, kind of in those leaves. Uh, and so they cause quite a bit of different damage, but they can look quite similar to flea beetles. So they are a little bit more round and they do hop off the leaf as well when disturbed. Uh, we have the milkweed bug. So if you're growing milkweed at all for uh, you know pollinator gardeners and things like that, the milkweed bug can be um, considered a problem in that case. And they are relatively large. You can see here on the right side, the immatures that then develop wings and become these matures and they can feed on the uh, seed pods or the seeds of milkweeds. And they're actually considered um, uh, kind of generalist uh, or, or, or um, kind of opportunistic. So they could actually feed on some things like monarch eggs and larvae, as well as oleander aphids. So in terms of oleander aphids, it can consider, you know, beneficial predators, but if they're feeding on monarch eggs and larvae, that's considered quite problematic. Uh, so they would need to be um, removed, especially if they're being used to try and promote uh, monarch butterfly populations. And then we got white flies, right? So y'all already heard quite a bit about white flies and their populations. The eggs, again, very hard to see with the naked eye, very difficult. You can see here um, this, these grouping of eggs and their immatures are also very hard to see with the naked eye. So throughout my entire um, research with white flies, I always use the head lens to find immatures. Uh, it can also be very easy to like mistake some of these curled up trichomes as an immature white fly if you're not careful because they're relatively transparent. Uh, and so again, it does really help to use um, a hand lens or, or a head lens. And uh, you can see the pupae, they, they become pupae and the pupae are a lot easier to see with the naked eye as well as the exuviae. So after the adults, the adult white flies come out of this pupa, you're left with this empty casing. Um, and, and so that's, that's also easier to see with the naked eye. They do also produce honeydew and sooty mold, and they are highly generalist. And it's very important to stay on their populations early because if their populations build throughout the season, that's when you get really hit hard on your poinsettias. So you really want to, to have some good early suppression of this particular pest. And then we got the Duponchelia moth or a European uh, pepper moth, which is seven eighths of an inch wingspan. Uh, and larvae are found deep in the canopy and they girdle stems of plants. So if you're not careful, you know, you'll see basically parts of your plants just like kind of dying and wilting. 
there are many things that could be causing that. But if you look deep in the canopy of that plant, you find some webbing and frass, uh, you find some girdling of those stems, there's a good chance you're looking at this Duponchelia moth larva. And uh, they do produce silk. So that means when they produce that silk and they're deep in that canopy, insecticidal contact can be very challenging. There are pests of at least 35 species of plants, including things that are kind of naturally occurring or weeds that are nearby, like ban uh, we have bindweed, lamb's quarters, poinsettia fig, basil, pomegranate, hackberry, and chrysanthemums. All right, and then we got mealybugs. All right, the adults are about 0.15 inch long. Now this does depend on the species. That's the for the female Madeira mealybug. The immatures, again, are very hard to see with the naked eye, especially in those first few instars. As you can see here, this like this uh, kind of beige color right here. The eggs are often encased and or protected in some kind of a waxing coating, as are the adults. And uh, they appear to be able to persist on um, contaminated pots, right? So if you have some pots that have high infestations of mealybugs and you're reusing those pots, uh, that can be a great problem. So uh, ensure that uh, you're either sanitizing those pots or do not reuse pots that have been highly infested uh, with, with mealybugs. And they produce honeydew and sooty mold as well. And lastly, getting on to thrips. All right, so thrips vary greatly in size as well, depending on species. And you can see here uh, this example of um, thrips from first instar all the way to adult. And, uh, and I'm actually not even certain. These, don't, these might not be the same species in this case. You can see this, um, this, this older mature is actually um, quite a bit larger than this adult form here. Um, but the adults are winged, immatures are relatively transparent and hard to see with the naked eye as well. Uh, one, 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 uh, one of them that's kind of hard to really see is echinothrips, or also known as poinsettia thrips sometimes. They basically blend in with the trichomes. They look like a trichome, essentially, uh, unless, again, you disturb them or you use a, a piece of um, whiteboard and you knock them down onto it. And they cause rasping damage, uh, but you do not get honeydew or sooty mold. Let's go past that one. And on to our last one that I was going to discuss for today is two spotted spider mites. And they are very small, right? Uh, and again, certainly helps to have a hand lens or a microscope even for, for collecting a leaf sample and looking at uh, closer, closer to actually see them. And so you can see some uh, mature adults here. We can also see some eggs of the two spotted spider mites as well. They cause sucking damage uh, as well, but no honeydew or sooty mold. And you can get some webbing. When you get some webbing, it's very difficult to get good insecticide uh, penetration. And they have a highly broad host range, so they will feed on all kinds of plants. So again, if you have uh, an early infestation, if you can catch it early and prevent it from going to your other plant materials, then you're kind of ahead of the game. And they prosper in dry, dusty, and high nitrogen environments. So there's been some work done showing that when you give plants more nitrogen than they can really make use of, um, these two spotted spider mites end up exploding and doing very well in their populations, as well as dry, dusty conditions. So sometimes just hosing off uh, some of those highly infested plants can help drastically reduce their populations. Uh, we also need to be aware of how that might affect plant pathogens. So that's not something I usually encourage in a greenhouse and or even nursery setting. So that uh, concludes uh, the presentation for today. I'm going to put up uh, very quickly before we get to any questions or conversations in the chat, uh, the survey for the pesticide applicator CEUs. So if you're looking for pesticide applicator CEUs for today, this one does qualify for one IPM pesticide applicator CEU. Make sure you fill out that form. Uh, you should have done it near the beginning of the presentation. And again, now uh, with your name, your email and TDA license number, uh, and uh, we will send out those uh, certificates.